nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. Well, welcome back. It's time to begin pulling this all together and, and wrapping up and understanding how the thermoelectric transport coefficients determine the thermoelectric performance of materials. And when Professor Shakuri gives his talk on devices and systems, you'll understand how that plays out in real devices. Okay, so let's, let's see if we can pull everything together into this uh, figure of merit. We set out at the beginning to try to understand how the thermoelectric transport coefficients were related to material properties. Okay, and we did that. We haven't talked about lattice thermal conductivity yet. I'll do that briefly in, in just a little bit. But the second question now that we want to address is how do we, uh, what material properties give us the highest figure of merit? How do we do that? So uh, first of all, I want to begin with a discussion of figure merit and a term called power factor that people in this field use. This is the expression for the figure of merit. Seebeck coefficient squared times electrical conductivity times temperature divided by the total thermal conductivity due to the lattice and due to the electrons. And this is dimensionless, so it's simply a number. Now, in the numerator, we have this quantity S squared sigma, which is very important for maximizing uh, the figure of merit, ZT. This is known as the power factor. So let's talk about the power factor first. So if I think about the power factor, what we will find is that the power factor is optimized when we position the Fermi level near the bottom of the conduction band. Depending on details, a little below the bottom, a little above the bottom, depending on band structure and scattering. So if we simply plot power factor versus Fermi level that we would vary with by doping, we would find that the peak occurs when the Fermi level is positioned near the bottom of the conduction band. That happens because of the different dependencies of electrical conductivity and Seebeck coefficient on Fermi level. For lower Fermi levels in this optimum point, we will have a higher Seebeck coefficient, which is good, but we will have a much lower electrical conductivity, which is bad. For Fermi levels that are above this optimum, we will have a higher electrical conductivity, which is good, but we will have a lower Seebeck coefficient, which is bad. So there's an optimum that occurs, and what we would like to do is to dope the semiconductor so that we position the Fermi level at that optimum. Now we might ask, you know, numerically, can we get a handle on what power factor is needed to do something reasonable with, uh, with thermoelectrics? So the power factor expression is given here. We need a power factor, we need a, a, we need a figure of merit of at least one to do anything reasonable with thermoelectric devices. And that's about where we are in most commercial technology today. So if I determine what power factor is needed, assuming that I have a total thermal conductivity of one watt per meter Kelvin, which is typical of a low thermal conductivity, good thermoelectric, then I can solve for what power factor is needed to get a Figure uh, a figure of merit of one. And what we find is that 300K, we need a power factor of 3.3 milliwatts per meter Kelvin squared. So that sort of calibrates us as to the magnitude of power factor that is needed. Okay, we'd like to have a lot higher to get even more efficient devices. That's the subject of research today. So if we look at that, you know, we, we could we might learn something by looking at some common well-characterized materials, which aren't good thermoelectrics, but we can look at their electrical performance because the power factor is determined by the electrical performance. Well, we can simply do this optimization for n-type germanium, and we'll find that we get a peak power factor that is 2. All right, a little less than the 3.3 that we would like to have, or 3.3 or higher. Uh, germanium is a semiconductor that has multiple conduction band valleys. Now, gallium arsenide is a semiconductor that has a single, very high mobility, light effective mass valley. If we do the optimization for gallium arsenide, we get a power factor that is 0.8, considerably less. Okay. 
if we understand what's happening there in a in germanium we have a reasonably high effective mass and density of states because we have many valleys the optimum position for the fermi energy is a little below the bottom of the conduction band for gallium uh, arsenide the optimum position is inside the conduction band because we don't have very many states we don't have very many channels it turns out that we can get a reasonable conductivity a conductivity that is close to that in germanium which is much higher number of channels by pushing the fermi level inside the conduction band but when we do that we lose in seebeck coefficient so the seebeck coefficient is significantly lower seebeck coefficient squared determines the power factor and the result is that this single valley semiconductor gives a significantly lower power factor than this multi valley semiconductor so that seems to be a general thing to look for in looking for materials that have high good power factors we first of all have to have an ability to dope the semiconductor so that we can position the fermi level where it needs to be to maximize the power factor we'd like to have a high conductivity at low fermi energy that means we need to have a lot of channels in the conduction band so that we don't need to push the fermi level inside the conduction band which lowers the seebeck coefficient so multiple valleys are generally good but when we have multiple valleys we'll have scattering between those valleys and that will lower the mean free path of the mobility so there's a trade-off everything in thermoelectrics involves a trade-off but in general it seems that multi multiple valleys are better it's also useful to have a light effective mass in the direction of transport right the effective mass might be anisotropic but if it's light in the direction of transport it will help maximize the mean free path it's also interesting to note that good thermoelectric materials like bismuth telluride have a significantly higher power factor than some of the most common well characterized uh, well understood best developed semiconductors like germanium and gallium arsenide or, or silicon for that matter okay we have talked about all of the electrical transport coefficients there's a very important transport coefficient that's related to the lattice itself the vibrations of the lattice also conduct heat and this gives us a lattice thermal conductivity now we could go ahead and calculate the lattice thermal conductivity and relate it to material properties just as we did for the electrical uh, properties we could think of a landauer device for thermal transport we have two contacts now but now we're talking about phonon transport so they're characterized by near equilibrium bose einstein functions but one of them is at temperature one the other is at temperature two and they're characterized now not by a fermi function but by a bose einstein function we could take our landauer expression for the electrical current and we could generalize it by instead of transporting charge we're transporting energy the energy of a phonon is h bar omega and now we have a landauer expression for thermal transport it's related to the transmission of phonons not the transmission of electrons it's related to the number of channels that the phonons can propagate in uh, not the number of channels that the electrons propagate in the number of channels that phonons propagate in is determined by the phonon band structure or phonon dispersion and now what's important is not the difference in the Fermi function, but the difference in the Bose-Einstein functions. So it's completely analogous mathematically. We can turn the crank and work things out and get the standard expressions for thermal transport and, uh, and electronic thermal conductivity. I won't go through that. I'll simply show you the results of that calculation here. You can see that they look very similar. We have a window function for electrons that tells us the energies at which the electrical current flows. We have a window function for phonons related to the derivative of the, of the Bose-Einstein function that tells us the energies at which the, the uh, phonons propagate or flow, the heat is transported. You can see that if we get to very small devices where we can count the channels, we have quantized electrical conduction we also have quantized thermal conduction 
which has been experimentally observed as well. So there are very close analogies between electrical transport and phonon transport that we can exploit. Now we can convert that expression into a macroscopic expression and we'll simply get that heat flows down a temperature gradient and we will get an expression that will relate the lattice thermal conductivity to the properties of the material. Okay. I could think of that expression, I could write it as proportional to the average number of channels in the Bose-Einstein window times the average mean free path. The more channels, the more heat flows, the less the mean free path, the less the heat flows. The conventional expression that people use when they derive this from the Boltzmann transport equation is similar. You can see that there's a velocity times a specific heat. Specific heat is related to density of states. So this is like a velocity times density of states. Velocity times density of states is what we mean by channels. And there's a mean free path uh, in both cases. All right. So we get the conventional picture of lattice thermal conductivity also from this Landauer picture. If we look at some typical numbers for a good thermoelectric material like bismuth telluride, the lattice thermal conductivity is less than one watt per meter Kelvin. If we look at common semiconductors like silicon, it's 150 times bigger, more than 150 times bigger. Silicon and, or germanium and gallium arsenide have lower thermal conductivities, but significantly higher than those of good thermoelectric materials. So this is the fundamental reason that common semiconductors are not good thermoelectric materials. So one of the exciting developments of the past couple of decades has been that people have learned how to artificially structure materials at the nanoscale to engineer the lattice thermal conductivity and to reduce it from its, the value it would normally have in a bulk material. This is done, for example, by introducing a high density of grain boundaries and other scattering centers that effectively scatter phonons but that are not very effective in scattering electrons. So it's an attempt to reduce the, the lattice thermal conductivity significantly while not affecting the electrical conductivity very much. And this has proven to be very effective recently. Uh, this plot sort of shows you uh, what has happened. When thermoelectric technology started, there was steady progress until about the year 1970 when figures of merit of one were reached. And then there was a period of time when almost no progress occurred. Okay. When the idea of using nanostructures to enhance thermoelectric performance was introduced and people began to learn how to do that, we've seen now and that we're in a very exciting time period when some very significant advances in the figure of merit are occurring. They are occurring because the lattice thermal conductivity is being engineered to lower and lower values. Now, I want to end by trying to pull it all together and talking about something that is known as the B factor or quality factor that will help us make sense of all of these trade-offs in a little bit better way. We can write the thermoelectric figure of merit in its traditional way. I can also do a little bit of uh, rearrangement in algebra, and I can rewrite it in a different way. Same expression, just rewritten in a different way. S prime is a dimensionless Seebeck coefficient. L prime is a dimensionless Lorentz coefficient. And B is a dimensionless quality factor. So if you do that algebra, the normalized Seebeck coefficient is just the Seebeck coefficient in units of K over Q. The normalized Lorentz number is just the Lorentz number in units of K over Q squared. And the quality factor is proportional to the ratio of the electrical conductivity to the lattice thermal conductivity. Note that it depends on Fermi level because the electrical conductivity depends on Fermi level. Now, it's been known for a long time that if you can increase B, you can increase the figure of merit. The initial work was done with parabolic bands, uh, but we've done it recently with more complex thermoelectrics as well. So here are some calculations, and what we've done in these calculations 
is just arbitrarily assume some value for the lattice thermal conductivity, and then sweep the Fermi level, which now increases this B factor, because it increases the electrical conductivity, which is in the numerator. We sweep it until we hit the peak of the power factor, and that gives us a peak in ZT. And you can see the lower the lattice thermal conductivity, the higher the figure of merit is. Now, if I were to look at the peak, and if I were to connect the maximum figure of merit, ZT, for each of those lattice thermal conductivities, I would get this dashed line. So at that dashed line, the quality factor B has its optimum value for ZT. Okay, if we do this calculation then, for a parabolic band semiconductor, we just get a simple plot that gives us figure of merit versus uh, quality factor at the optimum point to maximize the figure of merit. Now, you find that this curve is uh, universal for parabolic band semiconductors. It doesn't matter whether we do this in 1D, nanowires, 2D, quantum well, two-dimensional sheets, whether we do it in 3D, we get exactly the same curve. Okay, so it seems to be universal. Now, you might wonder, what if we look at complex thermoelectrics, these highly complex band structures? Would that give us an opportunity to increase the performance at a given quality factor? Well, surprisingly, what we find when we look at a dozen different complex materials with a dozen different band structures is that everything seems to fall on the line of this parabolic band result. Now, you may be at different points. A complex band structure might give you a higher B factor because it might give you a higher conductivity at the optimum Fermi level, but you'll always be on this curve, Kent's. Right. Okay, now why is that? You know, so one way that I, I understand this is by thinking of, you know, what if we were on this curve with a parabolic band, and then we found a better band structure that enhanced the Seebeck coefficient? Well, the Seebeck coefficient depends on this quantity E minus EF, its average. So we'll enhance that and get a bigger Seebeck coefficient. That will help. But the Lorentz number also depends on the quantity E minus EF. If we enhance the Seebeck coefficient, we will enhance the Lorentz number, which is on the, in the denominator. So anything we do to enhance the Seebeck coefficient will enhance the Lorentz number and make it difficult to pull away from this parabolic band result. Similarly, if we look for materials that have a low Lorentz number, they'll also have a low Seebeck coefficient. So this seems to be an argument. It's not a proof, you know, that this is universal. We still hope that there are materials that can get us significantly off this line. But it seems that the vast majority of materials will give us a figure of merit versus quality factor at the optimum point, which is the same as a parabolic band. Well, what that does is that simplifies things quite a lot for us because it means that there's only one thing that matters. We don't have to matter, we don't have to worry about Seebeck coefficients and Lorentz coefficients. We only need to worry about one thing. We only need to worry about the B factor. How do we maximize the electrical conductivity and minimize the lattice thermal conductivity? Those are the, really, it seems to be the only two things that matter in making a good thermoelectric material. So that's sort of the bottom line in trying to pull all of this together. Uh, we'll continue in the next section just with a quick wrap-up of everything that we've talked about during this tutorial.